rush on ahead in my own strength when you're right here. Lord, I don't want to rush on ahead in my own strength when you're weekend and that you're ready to come together this Sunday and be able to watch church online. Some encouraging news from the Rancho region is that Roman Navarrete got baptized. It was encouraging to be able to watch him on Friday with his family and just to know the impact he will have with his family, our teen ministry, and just the overall church. Yeah, it was definitely exciting seeing him, seeing him get baptized. What's also exciting is, as the Inland Empire region, we're going to kick off a new series in Philippians titled uh, Peace Under Pressure. And I thought, wow, what an incredible title, especially at a time like this. And uh, as I was thinking about this series, I, I was reading Philippians, and a scripture that stuck out to me was Philippians 1 verse 12. 
And Paul was writing this as he was in prison waiting for trial. And he says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what makes, uh, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And I thought, wow, what an incredible perspective for Paul to have. Yeah. Being in prison, waiting for trial, when all odds are stacked against him, he still has that sense of peace to him, uh, knowing that he is advancing the gospel. And I'm thinking of the time that we have right now as we are in quarantine, and, and it, it seems some talks are that it's going to extend, and some are saying it's going to shorten, and we're going to uh, open up uh, soon. But what an incredible time to be able to think and, and, and meditate on, on the gospel, but also how can we have peace in times of hardships and times of uncertainties yeah. like these today? And, and uh, I, I'm really excited to see what Philippians has for us in mm -hmm. this series and what we can learn from it yeah. as a church, uh, trying to uh, grasp peace in times of uncertainties and pressure. Uh, right now, we're going to pray and continue with our service. Dear God, thank you for this morning. Um, I know it's not our normal church service, but I pray that each and every one of us can really connect to what you're trying to help us grow in. God, um, I pray that just this coming week can provide a lot of fruitfulness for just our church. I know quarantine is unique, but I pray that this, this time can be a time to connect with our families, with our loved ones, and even just connect in a special way in our walks with you, and that this season can be one we look back on with a lot of um, just gratitude for the time of rest and the time of connection with you. I uh, pray for the rest of our service. I love you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, church family. It's uh, great to be together. Excited to be able to start our, off our series, Peace Under Pressure. You know, I know that this has been a wild time, but there has been a lot going on, not just in our world, but for many of us in our households. And uh, there has been pressure from all ends. My house, as I've shared with the Rancho group, has been a absolute madhouse. And my wife has done a amazing job homeschooling. Shout out to the moms. You are doing great. Even if you feel like you're not doing great, even if you feel like your kid's going to flunk out of whatever grade they're in right now, it's okay. Take a deep breath. <sighs> you're awesome. And you're doing a great job. And no one expected for 2020 to be like this. And uh, so whether the pressure is schooling, maybe the pressure is uh, some kind of financial distress or losing your job, there is so much pressure that you didn't expect to have coming into this year. Have you thought about that yet? You thought about from 2019 to now, like what were you thinking on December 31st, 2019, that 2020 would hold for your life? I don't know what you thought, but in my life, I definitely did not think it would hold this. I thought that 2019 had already been crazy. I know that there was a lot going on in our church. That was crazy. Uh, my daughter being born and then all that went uh, you know, into the hospital stays and all that was going on with her kidneys, I thought that was crazy. And now, 2020, it feels like the entire world has shut down. And uh, nobody could have foreseen the kind of pressure that you're experiencing right now in 2020 in your house, in your family, and just in your life. And so, as a staff here in the IE Church, we wanted to uh, focus our minds on how to have peace under the pressure that we're experiencing. I don't know if you felt peaceful, but I sure as heck have not felt peaceful these past couple of weeks, but I want to be, and I know that God has a plan for all of us to be men and women of peace under the pressure that we're experiencing. You know, when you think about peace, I don't know what comes to mind. Maybe it's pictures like this. Maybe it's tranquil beaches. Uh, maybe it is white sand beaches in the Caribbean where there's just not a worry in the world. You're sipping a pina colada, just hanging out, enjoying the view, and thinking about really nothing but how long your nap's going to be. Maybe this is more of your experience of peace up there in the mountains, away from every worry down below, and just spending time with God, being able to pray, meditate, 
Not think about all the worries that are waiting for you when you go back home and just overlooking an amazing view. You know, when I think about peace, I think about going on vacation with my family down to Escondido last year. Before last year, I would have never said family vacation was peaceful. For those of you that have little ones, going on family vacation is never, ever, usually peaceful. When you think about vacation and you have a two-year-old, there are nap schedules that get ruined. There's new locations for them to not be used to, so they're usually not napping very well. You're trying to go on day trips to like SeaWorld or whatever, and these kids skip naps, and so their attitudes are terrible. So when I thought about going to vacation last July and uh, spending time with my family, there was a gearing up of my soul of this is not going to be a time of relaxing for me and hopefully it goes okay but when we went down there I can tell you that whole week was so peaceful and uh, I went down to Escondido because my brother-in-law and sister-in-law they own a house down there they were out of town so they let us use it for free that was a add to my peace there that it was free and we just spent all day long in the pool about seven or eight hours each day were spent in the pool. We were so exhausted that the whole family took naps from 2 to 5 p.m. every single day. I never, ever, ever take naps. But on this vacation, I was worn out and didn't have a worry in the world and took a nap with the rest of my family. It was glorious. And I think for many of us, when we think about being peaceful, we think about the situations and the circumstances surrounding us are great indicators on whether or not we're going to be peaceful. When you look at a biblical peace, though, it actually has nothing to do with the circumstances surrounding us. Instead, it has everything to do with our mindset. Peace is a state of mind. It's not a state of circumstance. And so as we think about this concept of peace under pressure for the entire series that we're going to be doing for the next four weeks, I want to encourage you to change your mindset from thinking of peace as a you know, circumstance surrounding us that if the world is going crazy, then of course I can't be peaceful. Or if my house is going crazy, of course I can't be peaceful. But instead to understand that peace is completely in your mind. That peace is a tranquility, is a lack of disturbance, it's an understanding, it's a clarity of mindset that there is something so much greater, something so much more powerful in control, and that is God in our lives, rather than all the other things surrounding us. I wanna show you a picture right now of a biblical version of peace. Now, as you're looking at this picture right now, you may be thinking, this is the exact opposite of peace. In fact, this image is giving me anxiety, just looking at it. If you zoom in here, you see that the bird is sleeping. It's resting in the middle of the storm. You know, God is so much more interested in helping your, your focus, your perspective, your mindset, to change and to become at peace more than your circumstances. You know, many of us have never found peace because we're always looking for the things around us to change in order for us to feel peaceful. You know, as you think about this time that we're going through, where has the level of peace been in your life? Have you been stressed out? Have you been kind of a pain in the butt in the house to be around? I know I can be. I know as I think about who I am around the house, I so desperately want to be a kind of father or husband to my wife, and yet too often I am angry, I'm frustrated, I'm easy to irritate and to annoy, and I'm quick-tempered, and I have got to be really, really careful because if I am not aware of how I'm coming off to my kids, if I'm not aware of the way I'm acting in my house, I am going to be only this angry person all the time because of the stress that I'm experiencing in my life right now. If any of you guys can relate, give me an amen even though I can't hear you right now. You know, many of us are experiencing more stress in our lives than we ever have before. We're scared. We're a little bit freaked out about the future. And I want to encourage you that God is more interested in your mindset being at peace 
than even changing the circumstances. Now, that may be incredibly discouraging to you. You may walk away from what I'm saying right now going, what are you talking about? Nothing is going to change. What do you mean? That's not what I came to hear at church. But God is not interested in just taking care of the circumstances. He'll deal with it in his right timing. But he's more interested in dealing with your mindset on helping you be a peaceful woman or man of God, despite all the storms, just like this bird that has a storm surrounding him and is sleeping. I want to be that kind of man. I hope you want to be that kind of person that is so at peace that no matter what's going on, you're sleeping. You're at rest. You're having some of the best days of your life because you know that God is in control of all that's going on. You know, as you think about what it takes to be at peace in these circumstances. It takes us being able to see God in all that he's doing in the circumstances surrounding us. As you think about the times in your life where you were most at peace in in all the circumstances that were difficult and going through it, you were challenged and you were feeling a bunch, it's because you understood God was doing something through it all. If you don't understand what God's doing, then you feel like, man, why am I being struck down with this awful fill in the blank sickness, this awful plight of my life, this awful financial situation? And you get resentful towards God. But if you see God in every circumstance that you're facing right now, then it becomes almost like a game. It almost becomes an experience. We're going to look at the Apostle Paul here in Philippians, and that's going to be the book that we're going to be you know, digging into for the next couple of weeks. And we're going to study out the book of Philippians. Today we're going to focus in Philippians 1. It, it was a book written around 62 A.D., by this man, Paul, who became an apostle after being a persecutor of the way of Jesus and of Christianity. And so now he is in house arrest in Rome, waiting his fate. He doesn't know what's going to come next. He doesn't know if he's going to be beheaded tomorrow or if it's years from then. And we all know now, if we know the history of it, that he was beheaded around 64 AD. So only two years later, he was going to be killed. And he writes these words that I think are extremely useful to us as we're going through some of the most pressurized times of our lives, some of the most stressful times of our lives, he can relate to being in house arrest. You know, he experienced years of house arrest. You've only experienced a couple weeks. And for many of us, we're already dying. We're already feeling like, get me out of here. Paul was there for years, but look at his perspective because he was focused on what God was doing and not just the surrounding circumstances that he was facing, not just the situations that he was going through, but he saw God in everything. Look at these first choice verses here. In Philippians 1, verse 1, it reads, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the first fruits of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You know, as you look at Paul's experience that he's expressing here and the things that he's writing in this letter, you don't get a flavor that he's discouraged. You don't get a flavor that he's hurting. You don't get a flavor that he's stressed out. You you actually get an extremely spiritual perspective. And he mentions God or Lord or Jesus Christ 
14 times in 11 verses. Jesus was at the center of everything he was talking about. God and what God's doing and why we're doing this and what we're, we're seeing the fruit to become and what it's going to produce in us. Because of all the things God is doing, don't you understand it, church in Philippi? He keeps trying to get these men and women to understand all that God's doing while he's sitting there in house arrest. What would you have written if you were there? What would you have been sharing and saying if this was your book that you were writing? You know, as we look at at Paul and the mindset that he has, He did not allow his circumstance and the things around him to disrupt his peace. As you think about your peace these last couple of weeks, have you allowed the circumstances that you're facing to disrupt your peace? How did Paul do this? How did Paul overcome this? He had Christ at the center of his mindset. He had Christ at the center of his thoughts. You know, as I think about my days, there's so many things that can be at the center of my days. As you think about yours, I'm sure there's a lot going on in all of our lives that can get in the way of getting us to think about God. But when you just think about God, just take a moment right now, just think about the splendor of who God is. Think about the power of God. Think about the might of God. Think about the peace of God. Whatever part of God that you want to think about right now, it automatically changes your perspective. If you're stressed out and you think about how powerful and big God is, you realize you have nothing to be stressed out about. It's going to be taken care of. God is bigger than all of it. If you're thinking about all the craziness that's going on in your house right now, and you just think about the tranquility and peace of God, and the quietness, and there's the silence, you know, that's been a thing in our house There hasn't been a whole lot of silence in our house. But you think about spending time with God and just the peace of God. It changes your entire perspective, just taking moments to meditate on God. Paul had littered throughout his scripture, writing about God and God this and Jesus Christ this. And on the day of Jesus, we have got to fill our minds with God. We've got to fill our minds with thoughts about who God is, what he's doing, how he's actively at work within each one of us. And as we think about this God that we serve, it's amazing how it changes the entire focus. You know, Jesus here in John 16 is referencing the end of his life. And he's referencing that he is going to die, that he is going to go to the Father. And it says in verse 32, A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. Does that sound familiar or what? You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know, as you look at what Jesus is trying to communicate, he's saying, I'm going away. And for the apostles, this was a scary thing because they had been along with Jesus on all the roller coasters of emotion, of life, of the miracles, the experiences, the persecutions, the the scary moments and the the moments of absolute triumph. They were there when he fed the 4,000 and the 5,000. They were there when he he healed the lepers or the blind, when he saw amazing things take place. They were there when everybody wanted to stone him and he just walked through the crowds and was unable to be harmed because of the power that existed in him. They were there for it all. And now he's saying, I'm going away. I'm no longer going to be with you. And he gives them this admonition. He says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. Now, that doesn't necessarily compute in my head. Maybe it does in your head. But he's trying to connect them with the understanding that there is a plan in place. There is a help in place. There is the Holy Spirit in place in place that we'll talk about in a little bit that is there to give us an immense amount of peace no matter what we're going through. He goes on and said, in this world you will have trouble. 
And I don't want to minimize the troubles that you're going through. Many of us, our lives haven't changed much other than it just being inconvenient. For others of us, though, this has been crazy. This has been the most challenging time of your life. And I want to tell you that I am sorry that you're going through the things that you're going through, but it's not without effect. God has a purpose for the pressure that you're experiencing right now. He has a plan for the things that you're going through in your life. He doesn't just leave it up to chance for you to figure it out on your own. God wants you to hear this morning from this lesson that he has already overcome the world. You can take heart because he is not just leaving you to the wolves. He's not just leaving you to be destroyed. He's not saying, figure it out on your own. He's saying, I'm leaving you to go to the Father so that someone greater can come after me, so that the Holy Spirit can do work on our souls. He is so much greater than anything that we can face in this world, that we can go through. He's obviously so much greater than COVID-19, but he's greater than your financial problems. He's greater than even your marital problems that maybe you're experiencing as you're stuck in the house together. He's greater than all the shame that you feel towards your sin. He's greater than all of that. He's overcome the world. Take heart, because he has something so much greater that should give you peace. He is walking alongside each and every one of us. All of us these days are on Zoom calls, or maybe that's not your your program of choice. Maybe it's house party, or maybe it's on Facebook or FaceTime. I don't want to offend anybody. I know some some people use uh, the Microsoft one, whatever that is. Hey, to each his own, right? But we see people on screens all day long. You know, I'm trying to get those like blue light glasses to protect my eyes against the computer because I'm just on a computer screen all day long. And for some of you, you're used to it. Some of you, that's what your day is like normally. For me, that is not my normal life. But we're on these Zoom calls all day long and it kind of reminds me of a reality TV show. Because you can portray in that little screen whatever you want. If you want to come into that call and say, things are good, life's good, family's good, no one is the wiser. No one would know what's actually going on in that house. No one knows what's going on in your heart. No one knows what's going on in your own spiritual walk with God. And so we are are kind of in this experiment, if you will, almost like reality TV, where we know it's not real, but at the same time, it kind of feels real, so we kind of go along with it. I think that we as spiritual beings can be just like that on Zoom calls. In our spirit, we know we got to get open. We know we got to be real. But if we don't want to, there's nothing stopping us from just hiding out and expressing, yeah, things are okay. No problems here. I want to encourage you. If you are not at peace, and it's understandable that many of us are not experiencing peace right now, be open. Be real. Get honest with the people in your church. Talk to people around you. There are so many people that God has sent specifically to you to take care of you in this time. You may not even see it that way, but God has aligned the stars, aligned the people in your life. He set everything up and orchestrated it perfectly so that you would have the peace and the people around you, these peace givers to help you through these times. We can't just give off this pat answer of, you know what, things are okay, no big deal, especially when we're going through it, let's be honest with one another. Paul was not just saying what needed to be said. He genuinely is focused on God, and so he had this peace. All of us are going to face pressures through this time and for the rest of our lives that we feel like we can't handle alone. But God has orchestrated not just the Holy Spirit, although he has given us the Holy Spirit, but he's given us the church family to be able to lift our arms when we feel like we can't. I want to show you this clip right now that I found on YouTube. And it's hilarious because this guy, he, he kind of, he walks in there and he's setting up his video because he's excited to kind of show a little bit of a tutorial of bench pressing. He wants to show everybody how buff he is. And so he gets his, his weights on there 
And he, he starts to, to lift the weight, but it's very clear, very quickly, this weight is way too heavy for him. He, he had no chance of being able to lift this weight. And so it goes down. It seems like you can't see it there. I don't know if it's around his neck, but it looks like he's around his neck. And we're going to fast forward this video a little bit, but it goes on for three and a half minutes. Listen to what he says. Dad! Did you hear that? Dad! He's screaming for his dad. And there's no one coming, right? He goes through. And for the next three and a half minutes, he's struggling. Look here, he sets it up on the, the lower kind of rack there. And it almost falls and crushes his neck. And finally, at the very, very end of this video, he gets out. And he's able to get away. You hear him later on in the video yelling for his dad and mom, where were you when I needed you most? You know, God has given us people to be able to handle the pressures of our life. We cannot face it alone. But before he's given us all the people, he's given us the Holy Spirit. In John 16, verse 7, Jesus had referenced it when we talked about the passage there in 32 and 33. But in verse 7, it says, Very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. If you're the apostles, you're thinking, what? are you talking about? How is it possible that this is for our own good? But he goes on and he says, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You know what Jesus is saying to his apostles? He's saying, I am one man. And as I'm here, yes, I'm God in the flesh, but I can only be present wherever I am. Wherever my feet are is where I will be. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. It's everywhere at once that he is able to do the work of God at all times in all places and not bound by the di different dimensions that we have in our world. God is saying to you, it is so good that you live in this time because you have the Holy Spirit, you have this advocate, you have this spotter, if you will. You know, if that kid had had a spotter and from the weight room, he, he would have had somebody that could lift the weight from him and take it off his neck and protect him and not allow him to be crushed from all that was going on right then. You know, as you think about the Holy Spirit, that's what God wants to be for you. Your life, the pressure of your life is going to be so immense, so intense. Maybe right now you're facing more pressure than ever, or maybe it's going to come down the road for you. But wherever it is, the pressure is going to get to a place where you can't handle it, where the weight is too much. For those of you that have been in the weight room and know what I'm talking about, that's a scary thing to lift weights with no spotter. And God is saying, I can be your spotter. I want to be there to hold on to the weight. I want to be there to look after you. I want to be there to protect you so that you never have this weight crush you. The pressure that you're experiencing can be something that makes you into something so much more powerful, spiritual, so much greater of a disciple, or it can crush you under the weight. Which one is it going to be for you? Which one has it been for you over the past couple of weeks? Has this time crushed you or has, that, has it exposed you as being something so much greater than even you knew that you were? God is saying, I want to spot you. I want to protect you. I want to lift the weight off of you. And I want to do this alongside of you at all times. The Greek word is parakletos. It means counselor or helper or advocate. What it really denotes is someone that walks alongside you at all times, that is looking after you, that is your protector. That is what the Holy Spirit is. And because you have this advocate, because you have the Holy Spirit living in you, you are able to have peace no matter what is thrown your way. Whatever storm you're going through, you're able to say, I've got the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter. I've got the spotter. You know, there's times in our lives where we're going to face things that we feel like are so insurmountable until God is put in it, until we look at things through the lens of faith, 
Do we look at do we look at things through God's eyes? In Philippians one verse twelve, it continues on. I want to read these verses. As I was reading the verses earlier, it brought tears to my eyes because I started to think about what this guy was living in and under, and kind of the rule that he was in uh, in this house arrest, and what his perspective. They did not match in my head. They did not make sense. It didn't compute how someone that was going through so much suffering and fearful for his life could feel this level of peace until you understand that the Holy Spirit is walking all alongside him. That is, he's working inside his heart. In verse 12, it says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. I mean, that just starts off right there. Where, how do you stop a guy that has this kind of perspective? Verse 13, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of the selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? I mean, just look at Paul's perspective here. He says, whatever is going on in my life, God's doing amazing things. That is amazing perspective. That is a phenomenal way of thinking, of combating the stresses that he's experiencing. He keeps putting God at the center of his mindset. He says, first, this has happened so that we can have the entire palace knows about God. Then he goes on and says, yeah, yeah, I know people are bashing me and talking behind my back, whatever. As long as they're preaching the gospel, what does it matter if they do it for rivalry or if they do it to upstage me? It doesn't matter. He goes on in verse uh, 18 or the second part of 18, yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Again, he flips the situation that he's going through in saying this is the very thing that's going to advance the gospel early on in the passage, that is causing there to be an advancement of the knowledge of Christ as it continued, and now this is going to be the very thing that gives me salvation, that gives me deliverance. The pressures you're facing are giving you salvation. Do you believe that? Do you believe the things that you're facing right now, the hardships that you're going through, are the very thing that's going to get you to heaven? In fact, I would dare say you can't get to heaven without those challenges. God has perfectly set up your life to face the pressures you're going through to get you to heaven. Wow, what a change of perspective. If you truly live life understanding that the things that are most painful about your life, those are there so that you'll go to heaven. The reason he gave you that health problem, the reason he gave you those issues in your finances, the reason he gave you that marriage that you resent and wonder why you're even in it, the reason he gave you that kid that's just a problem, it feels like all day long, is to get you to heaven. And if you truly believe that, you will live a different life, full of peace, because you know this is actively giving me deliverance. Verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's unstoppable with that kind of mindset. If you kill him, he wins. If he lives, he continues to advance the gospel. He wins. You cannot stop a man that has that kind of mindset. As you think about your mindset, has Satan had too many victories because he shut these doors in your life and you've gone, okay, now what? Now what can God do with this? 
God is saying, if you truly understand the advocate that I've given you in the Holy Spirit, if you truly recognize the deliverance that these circumstances are giving you, then no matter what you're going through, it's perfect. It is the perfect situation for your life. As it continues on, he says in verse 22, if I am going, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. He's having a wrestling match in his mind about wanting to die to be with Christ in heaven, or should I stay with you? Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit. What spirit is that? In the spirit of the Holy Spirit and God's spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Paul would die two years later. He would be on house arrest for the remainder of the, his life. He never got out of the circumstances that he was facing. In fact, in worldly terms, he actually had the circumstances, they got worse. He was beheaded and killed there in Rome. But as he's speaking, you can't help feeling just excited about Paul's perspective on his life. He felt a sense of, I, I could die, that's a win. If I, if I live, that's a win. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's all good all the time. I want that spirit. I want that heart. I want that perspective. You know, when I was growing up, I played sports. I played basketball and baseball, played a little bit of football. And uh, my, my sport that I loved probably the most was, was basketball. And so I made the freshman team. I was so fired up. I went into the weight room. I had never worked out in a weight room a day in my life. And the thing that all the freshmen were trying to do was raise uh, uh, one plate. So a plate is 45 pounds. And so you put two 45 pounds on each side, one on each side, and uh, you are able to lift it. It's 135 pounds if you count the bar. And, uh, and so I remember growing up in high school, that was like my ambition. So I would go in the weight room and I started, I lift the bar. And I was like, throw more weight on it. So I threw on like tens <laughs> and I was like, whew, okay, that's, that's my max right there, baby. Like 65 pounds, I, I believe. And everybody was going, man, you can do more. I believe in you. So then we put on another five and it pretty much sank down to my chest immediately. I was a scrawny, weak 120 pound freshman, little punk 14 year old. If you're a 14 year old, doesn't mean you're a punk. I was a punk though. And so I was going to the gym all the time, trying to get to a place where I could, you know, raise the bar 135 pounds, do the plate, and get everybody's approval. And so I was constantly working out. And about three months in, they put the plates on and they say, Mains, it's your turn. And the whole gym worked out, you know, every level, freshman, sophomore, JV, and varsity worked it out in the gym at the same time. So there's like 60 kids in this gym. So they say, Mains, your turn. And they had put 245s on each side. And I, I, I remember there was just this pit in my stomach of what am I going to do? There's no way that I can raise this 45 pounds. I never tried before. I was getting stronger, but I had no idea what it was going to be. And so they started hyping me up and they're rubbing my shoulders, hitting my shoulders and going, you can do this. I believe in you. I'm sitting there going, there is no chance in the world that I'm going to lift this weight. So I go down there, you know, I take an extra long time to align my hands on the barbell there and uh, take some really deep breaths. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I just thought it looked cool because all the buff guys did it. So <sighs> I started controlling my breathing and I lift up and I tell you what, that barbell was so heavy. It came crashing down on my sternum. 
as fast as it possibly could. Gravity could not go fast enough. It went straight down to my sternum. But the guy that was spotting me was a senior. And this senior really liked me. And uh, we were friends. And so he was my spotter. He had helped me lift it off, and he never let go of the bar. And so it came slamming down, and he wasn't expecting it to go that fast. But it comes slamming down. It hit my chest. I ended up having a bruise later on when I got home. I was like, oh, my goodness. I got messed up. It was just a line across my chest. But he never let go of it. And so when it came down to my chest, he acted as though it was bouncing off my chest. And then he pulled it up pretty much totally deadlifted it himself. And so I, I'm pulling it down, and he is pulling it up, and I really don't feel like I did much of anything. But the entire gym erupted as if I had just lifted up this 135 pounds. And immediately I knew I couldn't do it again, so I re-racked it, and I jumped up, and I started hitting everybody. I was hyped. I was excited because they, they thought I had done it. As we were walking out of the locker room, I turned to my buddy who was my spotter. I said, Why, why'd you do it, man? Thank you. Appreciate it. He said, you know, we, we all need help sometimes. I remember being a freshman. I'm glad to help you out, dude. And it made me think as I was writing this lesson about that's how the Holy Spirit is. There are people watching. They're kind of nervous of how are we going to react under pressure? How are we going to feel? How are we going to respond to the things that we're going through in our lives right now? And everyone's watching what we do under pressure. They're cheering us on, but they're also kind of interested to see what is this going to mean for a Christian to go through these experiences. And the advocate, the Holy Spirit, the helper is right there. And even though the weight is too much for you, life is too crazy for you, you can't do it alone. God's given you this church and he's given you the Holy Spirit to be able to help you lift that barbell up and hear the approval of everyone around you. If you try to do this alone, everyone will mock you. They will make fun of you. They'll say, well, you look at you. You thought you were a Christian. You can't do it. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to walk alongside of you, if you allow the kingdom, the church that's surrounding you to help you lift up that barbell, there is nothing that you can't face. No pressure of life that you can't overcome. Paul understood that the pressures of life were nothing in comparison to what the Holy Spirit could do in his life. If he allowed his mindset to be focused on God, he allowed his mindset to be focused on what Jesus was doing through the Holy Spirit in his life, he was unstoppable. You too can be unstoppable. As a church, God is calling to you this morning to be completely at peace under the pressure that you're facing because you recognize the helper that you have and you have nothing to fear because God is near us, he's close to us, he's taking care of us and helping us overcome everything that we're going through in our lives. We must understand that peace is not circumstantial, it's not the state of being of things that are around us, but it's a mindset. It is a way of thinking. It's an understanding of who God is and how small the storm is in comparison to God and what he can do. The Spirit has only been able to come because Jesus died on the cross. And as we finish out this sermon and we focus on communion and what Jesus did, he said there in John 16 that I'm going to go away because someone so much greater is going to be able to come. This advocate is going to be able to be everywhere at once. And I'm only one man, but you're going to have this Holy Spirit. That only happened, though, because our Lord died on the cross. Because Jesus was willing to be crucified for your sins. That God in the flesh was willing to die so that we could have this spirit that helps us, that spots us, that takes care of us. Let us pray for communion. Dear God, we are so grateful for this time. We're grateful for the opportunity to have peace under any pressure we're facing in our lives. We recognize that you are the helper, that you are the advocate, the counselor, that you walk beside us through all the pressures of life, through all the storms that we're experiencing. That only happens because Jesus Christ died on the cross. Jesus, we want to say thank you now as we 
meditate on your death. We want to say thank you that you allowed the Holy Spirit to come through your death and your resurrection. We want to say thank you that you lived a sinless life. We want to say thank you that you overcame this world. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Estimates, and we have the opportunity to participate in today's worship mm -hmm. by sharing some thoughts about the offering. So I'm not sure where everybody is at uh, emotionally, uh, financially, mm -hmm. spiritually, uh, physically. You should be in the living room watching this. So, um, but it's been an interesting last six weeks. Mm -hmm. So um, as for us, we're going to share where we've been at financially and spiritually. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll start off spiritually. It's It's been interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's been awesome. But the connection's been interesting. Yeah. Um, everything's been through Zoom. So uh, Devo's through Zoom. Uh, Bible studies through Zoom. Uh, D times Zoom. We're Zooming. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, we're trying to connect as much as possible as with our family. Uh, connecting with the boys, yeah. uh, Nico, uh, Carlos, Angel, Josiah, Brian, um, just really connecting with them in a different way because mm -hmm. we have uh, a focused time. Yeah. So um, as for my job, nothing's changed. Uh, I'm still working full time. Um, I was telecommuting for a couple weeks, but other than that, I'm back in the office and uh, dealing with the Municipal Services Ontario. Um, I actually uh, had a, a workshop last week because the city decided to um, that they're going to move forward with developing the Great Park. It's 355 acres down south and phase one is 55 acres. So it reminds me of the time when Jesus was walking in large crowds and he was expressing the commitment level of the ministry. And he turns around and looks at him and says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to finish it. And nowhere within that scripture does it say that we stop building. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's drawing me to that scripture and uh, drawing our family mm -hmm. and just really focusing on the areas in our life that we need to still continue to build. Yeah. So that's my side for finances. <laughs> my wife has a different story. It's very so. different. Uh, for me, uh, things have changed. Uh, I've been working home uh, three times out of the week. Twice of that, I have to go into the office. And um, due to you know my my company, the industry that we're in, a lot of our projects have you know they're on a standstill. And um, one of the things that has been impacted is uh, one reducing you know our staff by almost fifty percent. Um, that's been cut. The other thing has been our salaries that has also been a hit. And, you know, as, as I was um, going over it with my husband, like mm -hmm. salary is changing. Is that going to, to hurt us? 
uh, financially getting advice on it as well, you know, just to get my heart to a place where I don't want to waver mm -hmm. when it comes to that. Both uh, Adrian and I believe that, you know, we've made drastic changes already mm -hmm. within the past year where, where we, we don't want to lose focus. We want to continue building and especially building God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that was asked to me was, is this going to cause extreme hardship? And I'm like, no, it's not. And it was good to, to even come to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. It just solidified, you know, how God has taken care of us through this. Yeah. And, like, and like I expressed, uh, that meeting that I had about the great park, um, one of the topics was uh, circulation and accessibility. So they're trying to figure out the layout for uh, three different types of paths. Uh, you had one, which was like kind of a small discovery path. Uh, the second one was a, um, a secondary path. But the first path is the multi-purpose path. And it's, it, it facilitates all, the, all types of usage needed to maintain that facility. So you have um, enough room for uh, recreational usage. Um, you have enough room for maintenance uh, vehicles. You have enough room for PD. You have enough room for fire. All of these necessities that are needed to operate this great park. And the same thing with our kingdom. Our great kingdom mm -hmm. needs that main path so that it can facilitate all mm -hmm. our needs. And this, this part of the offering is giving back to God's kingdom so that we can continue to maintain that arterial that runs through our church mm -hmm. to bring people in, to help people out, mm -hmm. to teach, to, um, to train, mm -hmm. and to save. Mm -hmm. So it reminds me also of another scripture in First Chronicles. Yeah, it's uh, First Chronicles 16, verse 8 through 12. It says, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name, that the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. So as we give our offering today, let us continue to build the tower in great faith remembering his wonders mm -hmm. and miracles he's provided in our lives. Mm -hmm. If you like this channel, please press the like button and subscribe. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, just for this time, just to uh, draw closer to you. I uh, thank you for technology. Yeah. I thank you for the opportunity to express our thoughts and our convictions. But I pray, Father, please, for the church. I pray that... Um, for also the frontline workers mm -hmm. that are dealing with this situation, that they may find rest and resolution. I also pray for those that have been directly impacted, yeah. that they find recovery and a renewed faith. Mm -hmm. We thank you. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Bye, guys. Bye. Sorrows like sea billows roll Whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well with my soul It is well
shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well, it is well with my I'm Mike Tolliver. COVID-19 appeared on the world stage on January 23rd when China locked down the Hubei province. We have all watched as nations around the world have battled this virus. Many of our brothers and sisters are experiencing and facing these dire circumstances and Hope Worldwide is providing help. In response, Hope Worldwide has opened a COVID-19 relief fund and has been active in helping folks around the world, including in India, Nepal, Africa, Central America, South America. They've been providing immediate relief with food and medical supplies, along with emotional and trauma support. We're proud of Hope Worldwide, and initial funds are being sent to 24 nations. As the virus moves across our planet, let's remember some facts. Italy has about 80 ventilators per million people. Nigeria has less than one ventilator per million people. The U.S. has 23 doctors for every 10,000 people. The Congo has less than one doctor for every 10,000 people. Uh, we have more or less 40% of the families in the churches who have lost their jobs. The church in, in, in Ecuador is really facing bodies uh, lying in the streets. People have to, you know, rely on what they make on a daily basis to be able to feed. We started realizing that a lot of people are looking for just basic food. And, uh, they don't have money to uh, buy food. Hope Worldwide needs your support so that they can continue to provide relief with the goal that no disciple goes to bed hungry tonight. We are all proud of Hope Worldwide and their impact. They are eager to be of service to those who are suffering in the storm of COVID-19 that has engulfed our planet. I know that there are needs in every country and we're all experiencing this crisis in various ways. However, if you're in a position to give, please donate today. A little bit can go a long way. So go to hopewworg forward slash COVID-19 to help right now. I know some of us are hurting, while others of us are in a strong position to help. All of us can pray for our brothers and sisters that are currently suffering. Let's pray for God to work powerfully through all of us and through Hope Worldwide. God bless.